Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Turfgrass Epistemology. I'm Travis Shaddix. I hope you're doing well. I understand there are several people who listen to the show while working. So that's nice. Maybe you're uh, doing some applications this morning. Maybe you're in your office. Maybe you're in your car. In any case, welcome. And thank you for for uh, watching and listening. Had a good attendance last night. I was really happy to see so many people. There was quite a few people here. I, I guess we're getting a little bit of a following going. Um, yesterday's topic was about nitrogen leaching and fall applied fertility. And um, hopefully we provide a little bit of information that kind of helps justify the earlier applications of nitrogen rather than the later fall applications of nitrogen. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell on you, uh, Dave, if you're listening and working. I think that's safe, as long as it's safe. Um, what else is new? I think I told you I went to my son's math competition last night and realized how ignorant I am on math. Nothing new, but <laughs> it's very difficult questions. Um, I, I read the paper we're going to go over today. I read it this morning and I realized that, um, I probably should have saved this paper for the topic of clipping management. There's a reason why I included it because it talks about growth rate as, it, as we move into September and October. We talk, it talks about growth rates changing and stuff. But as I reread it this morning, I'm like, eh, this probably would have been better for clipping management. So I might, I might end up going back over this paper again whenever I get to the topic of clipping management, which right now, <clears throat> right now has four papers in it. So this would be the fifth paper if I add this in there, which I probably will. Uh, so yeah, the, uh, what was I going to say? There was something else. I can't remember now what it was. Anyway, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. I hope this is closing out your week. We have one more day left, but on Friday, I won't be here, but on Friday, but we're sort of closing things out. Let's get to the paper. The, um, Oh yeah, before I do, that's what I was going to talk about. I remember now I was watching, you guys have to remind me to stop searching for stuff on YouTube. I, I, I don't really watch YouTube turfgrass stuff at all. Um, I do, I do watch YouTube, but it's more, it's in another area. I, I, I enjoy it for other topics. I don't really search turf grass and stuff like that in there, but somehow I, apparently I got into like the algorithm. You, I don't know the YouTube algorithm and it's starting to show me like turf grass videos and things, <laughs> which is, you know, depressing. Actually, I watched a video yesterday of a guy who, who is this basically telling everybody to do exactly the opposite of what we're talking about for the last two months. He's basically saying you probably shouldn't be applying soluble in. You should be applying natural organic nitrogen and his soil temperatures were like 40 degrees, like extremely low. I don't know where he lives. I don't know where it is, but it must be Colorado or Utah or something. I don't know, but it was a current video. It was, it had just been released and he's applying organic nitrogen sources and to 40 degree soils and you know, so nothing wrong with that, I guess. But, you know, in terms of it's tur the turf response and um, the fall color and the fall growth and the spring color and so forth, the environmental risks and all this, all these things, when you combine them all together, it really paints this picture of early fall light applications, you know, half a pound to a pound of, you know, September-ish, early October is where you're going to get your most uh, efficient applications and it's going to have very little impact on the environment as opposed to later fall applications. But when you apply those 
organics and slow releases, as we've already shown when we, we compared it to polymer coats, we can, we saw a paper that compared it to, um, sulfur coats, reacted ureas. I don't know if we ever saw one yet that discussed natural organics yet, but you know, it's not one paper saying that low rates early in the fall of soluble nitrogen is probably the best management practice for the turf response and for, you know, in minimal environmental impact. It's not just one or two papers. There's many, many papers saying that. Um, and so the, the whole concept or the idea of like, well, I can put it out as slow and it's still going to be here in the spring doesn't really hold much water when you could say, well, just don't apply anything and just put out some soluble in the spring and you're fine. The, the, the whole idea of like, it'll slowly break down or, um, you know, fungi will break it down over time and it'll be available. All that's mostly BS. I mean, the, the evidence that we've been showing clearly indicates that it's still too cold to really initiate any release from those slow release nitrogen sources throughout the winter. Whereas a little bit of soluble nitrogen that remains in the soil when the temperatures do come up a little bit slightly periodically throughout the winter, that soluble nitrogen will be there to be taken up with very, very little risk of, you know, any environmental, you know, impact. So I don't know where these people are getting this information from, but it certainly is in contrast to what we've been discussing on this channel when it comes to fall fertility of cool season grasses. You know, there are purposes and, uh, you know, scenarios where slow release materials are at least as effective as soluble. But the papers we've been going over sure don't indicate that it's in the late fall uh, on cool season grasses. That's for sure. You're just not going to get near the response as you would from soluble in. And the, uh, you know, the risk is still negligible really with soluble in compared to slow release in the fall. In the fall, you're probably going to have for negligible offsite movement from both sources. Um, there might be slightly increased risk from soluble source. I'm sure I can find a paper or two that shows that, but, um, you know, the whole idea of putting out slow release nitrogen when the grass is not growing really and the ground's almost frozen there's just not a lot of evidence to support that and if there is i mean there is there's you'll you'll find a paper here or there but we're talking about many many papers that that you know indicate soluble is the way to go as opposed to you know a piece here or there from slow release so Anyway, I saw those videos and I'm like, man, <laughs> how do I get, how do I get myself out of the YouTube algorithm? I don't want to, I don't want to see these, these YouTube videos that are basically saying to do the exact opposite of what the evidence indicates. And that's what we're going over. And that reminds me, by the way, I mentioned it yesterday or the day before. I don't remember. I don't intend or desire or want anybody to walk away from these, these, uh, shows that I'm doing in the channel and say, you know, Travis Shattuck said this, so I'm doing this, or he said, do, do you know, I, that's not the intent at all. The intent is for, to equip you with the skills to find the information yourself, which obviously is what some people have been doing. There's, I think it was Looney last night that mentioned he went and found the article and read it. That's the intent is to, when you're, when you're faced or given some claim, you know, to, be able to find evidence in, you know, one way or the other about that claim and not to just regurgitate what Travis Shattuck said, because Travis Shattuck can be wrong, right? The, the evidence can be wrong too, but the likelihood is much lower with the evidence. So use these papers. Don't, don't, don't you know, <laughs> I mean, it's okay to, it's okay to talk about what I found when it's my research or whatever, I suppose. But, um, really just hang your hat on the refereed publications in, in turf grass in reputable turf grass journals uh, that are refereed though. That's what, that's what you want to find. That's really towards the top of our pyramid of evidence as, as uh, we have on a previous uh, show, we talked about the pyramid of evidence. The evidence doesn't even begin until it's published. 
So when someone walks in your door, I remember years ago, I was in Lauderdale and somebody walked in my door and I, and I, and they walked in a professor's door. I mean, he knows what I do for a living when he walked in and he was trying to, um, this gentleman, the salesman was trying to convince me uh, about his soluble nitrogen sources and how it was better than all the other nitrogen sources essentially. And, and he was going on and on. I was just listening and, you know, so forth. And he, he went on and said, well, you know, things like we, we use the best nitrogen in the world to create this product. And when it applies, when it gets applied to the leaf foliage, it, it's absorbed through the stom stomates is what he said, which drives me nuts. It's not stomates, it's stomata. Stomata is the plural. Stomates is not a word. I think it's probably found its way into the vernacular to where now I guess people maybe use it as maybe even the dictionary uses it as the plural of stomata, but it's stomata. Okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, it enters in through stomata and I'm just sitting there mentally going, this is probably what he says to everybody else when he walks into their shop. He's, he gives them his sales pitch. Now I, I know that it was, what he's saying is, is nonsense. I mean, it's his nitrogen source probably works fine, but it's, you know, what he was, the sales pitch he was using was, was nonsense. And the reason I mention all that is to say this, I feel sorry or sympathy for you know people who might not necessarily know the literature you know and not be equipped with um you know the the whereabouts or the, the know-how to go find the information maybe the guy's what he's saying is true maybe it's you know is taken up and maybe it is the best nitrogen know. if you don't know you might be convinced right so really that's part of what i hope the channel you know develops in the audience is an ability to initially listen to the claim open-mindedly and then critically evaluate, you know, whether or not it's true or not based upon published literature, published research. That's kind of where I'm hoping this thing goes. seems like it's kind of going that direction. Um, so I'll, I'll just read a couple of chats before I move on to the article. Um, Oh, Lush Lines, please tell me you found another one on YouTube, yeah, found another video. It wasn't about any of my work. The only reason I mentioned that previous video weeks ago was because he was talking about my research, but this one wasn't about my research. It was just about recommendations in general that were in conflict with what I've been talking about from these papers. Dave says, it's easy to learn misinformation on YouTube. It's not even that difficult to have it make sense in your head. If you don't know any better, fi oh, fi I find that early in my, I found that out early in my turf journey. Yeah. Well, I guess fortunately for me, I haven't been a victim of the YouTube turf grass, you know, <laughs> uh, vortex. I, I don't know, but, um, the one or two that, that popped up on my screen certainly, you know, took me back. I'm like, man, where did that come from? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think if you Lush says, I think if you watch lawn care YouTube videos regularly, you will need a lot live in therapist. By the way, my therapist changed. She decided to go and um, work with more uh, patients. More not go and work. She she ended up getting her uh, complete license months and months ago, and then she decided to go. I think she's going to work specifically with OCD patients now. I think that's what she, either OCD or ADHD. I can't remember. I apologize if she ever listens to this. I, I apologize. But um, so now I got to go find another therapist. And I'm like, Argh. finally had a one I was really connecting with, and she really helped me out a lot. There was a couple, um, there was a couple like step sort of things, like you know, let's work on this, work on this, and then work on that. Sort of a, a, a treatment plan approach rather than just spewing out whatever's on your mind and i like the treatment plan approach i was really making good progress and now i gotta go find someone else but anyway that's my update on that having said that i have another session today with the, the other therapist so anyway let's get into the paper today um may, maybe at some point i'll end up having enough uh patience to watch some of these videos and <laughs> go through them but man i just I, what i think about really is like who's watching those videos like ho i guess it's homeowners probably i don't know who watches those videos but i imagine it's homeowners watching them and then 
following their recommendations. And I mean, I don't know. I haven't watched them. I imagine there's some recommendations that are sound, but the one or two that have popped up, I think the algorithm has pulled like what my channel does or something and is spitting out videos that are in line with it or something. <laughs> like, I don't know. <laughs> but, but so far they're not, I mean, they're, the, they're in line with the topic, but the information that's being presented by those other YouTubers, are, <laughs> it's, it's not entirely accurate so i don't know we'll see where it goes uh let's get into the to the article here the article today is comparing cultivars of three cool season turf grasses for nitrogen recovery and clippings it was published in hort science in 2006 so this is an open access journal you can go download it for free go to uh ashs.org american society of horticultural sciences.org this was published by Haibo Lu and Richard Hull. Uh, Haibo has been at, I assume he's still at Clemson. He's been at Clemson for ages now. And um, he pu he publishes quite a bit. He's a, he's a good researcher. And then Dr. Hull has been at Rhode Island. I don't even know how many decades Richard's been at, at Rhode Island, but he's put out a tremendous amount of very high quality professors, students who end up becoming professors and those professors put out students and they, who come professors. So they, these, these are two good authors. Like I said earlier, I kind of wish I would have waited on this to discuss it during the clipping topic that I'm going to talk about at some point in the future, but we'll get into it. It's a, it's a good paper. I'll probably end up going over it again. As if you're new to the channel, I've, I've widened out several areas. This is just to keep me on track. If you want the whole article and read the whole thing, you can go and download it for free. Make sure we're on the page here. Okay. The introduction. Clippings contribute substantially to annual nitrogen budgets of turf soil ecosystems, and this must be factored into any turf grass management strategy designed to increase in use efficiency and minimize in losses to surface and groundwaters. So this is towards the end of the introduction. And when he says clippings contribute substantially to annual in budgets, this is true. And as I mentioned last night on yesterday's um, show, is that that's already been factored in if you're following in the nitrogen rate recommendations as they've been conducted on similar soils. So, for example, in I'll just use Florida because it's the one I'm most familiar with. In Florida, generally, we'll do three rate studies. We'll do one in the in the Northwest Panhandle, one in the, they will they will do one in the Northwest Panhandle, one in North Central Florida. And then one in South Florida, because those are the, where the three re, turf rest research centers are. And those are three distinctly different ecosystems and different soil systems. And so what rate might occur in, say, the Northwest Panhandle is, might be very different than in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, because of the different, not only different temperatures, but different soils. This Fort Lauderdale soil, believe it or not, is very organic. It has a lot of organic material in it. And so it's mineralizing a lot more nitrogen than the soil, say, in North Central Florida, where it's very, very deep into soil soils in North Central Florida. So when we have a rate recommendation, let's say we recommend, um, you know, one to five pounds in or whatever the number, one to four pounds in, that was done on a calibration study that included the nitrogen being mineralized on that turf at that time, right? It's when the rate has been recommended and you use that rate on a soil that it w is not similar to where the calibration was conducted is when you have to figure out somehow to to add in the nitrogen budget or remove the nitrogen budget based upon where the calibration was done relative to your area. So when he says this, it's absolutely true. But if you're in this particular case, they were in Rhode Island. So if you're in a similar soil in Rhode Island or Connecticut or New Hampshire or wherever it is, wherever you're at, and it has a similar soil, a similar organic material, similar mineralization rates, then you don't really need to factor it in because it's been factored in already from the calibration study. But if they did a study where there's been a lot of nitrogen mineralizing during the calibration, and then you go and use those same rates on a soil where there's not a lot of organic matter being mineralized, then you might not be applying enough, or you, and I guess you'd be applying too much, actually, or one way or the other. You'll be applying too much or too not enough based upon the difference in the natural amount of nitrogen that's being mineralized in the soil, okay? Yeah, so just keep that in mind, is that there is a, a significant benefit or addition of nitrogen in many situations from the existing organic matter. So if you get a new soil from a home lawn that's been just stripped out, a house is 
uh, built and then they just put sod on top and there's no real soil below it. There's no organic material below it. That's a very different situation than a 15 year old lawn that's been there and mature or that soil probably has a lot of organic material built up in it and the nitrogen's being mineralized year over year. Just keep that in mind. Let's get back on target here. I can get my pencil out. However, turf grasses differ in clipping production and nitrogen content as do cultivars of the turf, of turf species. Differences in clipping management of various turf grasses might influence efficiency of nitrogen use for long-term fertilization and culture. That's basically what I just said. To test this hypothesis, experiments compared cultivars of three field-grown cool season turf grasses for growth and clipping nitrogen recovery under a moderate nitrogen fertility regime over two growing seasons. Finding may provide quantitative da da da. Okay, I'm not going to worry about that. Now, this was done on multiple cultivars. They had three species, multiple cultivars. Ten cultivars of each Kentucky bluegrass, perennial ryegrass, and tall fescue, which were listed in this table from the National Turf Grass Evaluation Program. So this was going on as an in-tep study. I don't know if this was a, a key part of the study or if they just did this in addition to the study, the in-tep study. But this was part of the in-tep study. So they got a bunch of plots out there. Um, the evaluation, well, the evaluation trials, uh, had been seeded in 1985, 86 or 87 at the CR Scogley Turf Research Center in Rhode Island. Okay. The study, okay. The soil was a pH of 6.5. The plots received three pounds of nitrogen per year in granular form as all three equal applications. They applied one pound in April, June, and November. Okay. 50% of the nitrogen was ammonium nitrate. The remainder, um, ammonium nitrate, yeah, and they're with the remainder as 25% urea and 25% methylene urea. So it's 25% slow, 75% quick release. Experiments were conducted on the mature turf during two growing seasons in 1990-91. So the, the turf was seeded five years prior. And then they, they were probably doing in-tep studies and maybe it kept going or maybe it ended. Who knows what was going on? And they then they started this study. So it, it's five or six years mature. So this is clearly a mature turf grass sward at this point when they started this study. They were mowed twice a week um, and the clippings were returned except when clippings were collected. Okay. Now we're going to get right into the results because uh, yeah, he does. He gets right into the results and I'm, I'll go down there and read this, but I'm just going to go through the, the tables because um, if I, eh, hopefully you can see the, the numbers. If you can't, then I'll, I'll do my best and work our way through here. So table one is the monthly this is all the cultivars within a species pulled together so you're going to see tall fescue kentucky blue and perennial rye you're not going to see any cultivars in table one this is all of them combined you're going to see the, the difference in daily clipping growth the difference in nitrogen content in the tissue and the difference in daily in recovery i'm not going to talk a whole lot about daily in recovery but we can if you like um so <clears throat> When we look, and you're going to see May, June, July, August, September, and October for each of these variables in the annual average, okay? Actually, I think that's the two-year average. Yeah, so this will be the total average. So these are probably monthly averages of the two years, and then this is the, annual, the, the total study average. And we see tall fescue, when it comes to the daily clipping growth, had the greatest growth on average, followed by Kentucky bluegrass, and then perennial ryegrass was the least. Now, if you're familiar with perennial, these three turf grasses, you might go, oh man, perennial ryegrass tends to be neat, require mowing more frequently than Kentucky blue or tall fescue. You, you might be in a situation where that's true. But this is total growth. So it's not just the height of the growth where perennial ryegrass tends to grow upright quite, red, quite rapidly. It's also the density and the thickness of the actual leaf blades itself, right? So we're cutting it off and we're collecting all the tissue. So while perennial ryegrass might grow straight up, it's relatively thin compared to some of these other turf grasses sometimes in some locations. Okay, nitrogen content. So I'm going to show the cultivar changes in the next table or the next couple tables. But in this particular table, I want to make sure we're, uh, we see the overall that Kentucky bluegrass required didn't require it it contained or had a greater amount of nitrogen in the tissue than than the other two species now this biologically there's probably not a whole lot of difference between 4.3 and 4.2 but uh, that's the i'm sorry when i say when i say that i mean percentages this is in milligrams per gram but this is 4.3 percent and 4.2 percent in these two turf grasses and then tall fescue had the lowest uh concentration of nitrogen in the tissue at 3.7 percent 
averaged across all the, the entire study, okay? But what I want to point out is that you're going to see pretty much, it looks like every species, for the most part, yeah, for the most part, every species looks has a similar trend in the growth rate and the nitrogen content. The growth rate is generally greatest in May for all these species. There's a little bit of increased growth here with Kentucky bluegrass as we move into June. Um, but you'll see May, June, July, August, and September, you're going to see the growth more or less decline from May all the way to, to October, really September, then it levels off between September and October. But you're going to see a reduction by a quarter and then reduction by half from May to June and then reduction by half from May to July and then levels off to August, but then it reduces again by almost half from August to September. We're seeing a reduction in growth rate as we move where our greatest growth is probably occurring in May and then starting to decline in June, July, and August and then kind of flattens out in September and October where it's, where it's um, nearly a, a third or even a, it looks like a third, maybe even a quarter of the growth rate that occurred in May is what's occurring in October. So the October growth rate and September growth rate is quite low compared to what it, what occurred in May, pretty much for every species. But look at what happens with the nitrogen content. Now, it's not so much, uh, it is evidence in the species, but there's it's oftentimes more evident in the cultivar. You're going to see the, cult, the concentration in the tissue generally go up. We start at 3.6 in May, then it goes to 3.1. But then it goes to 3.5, 4.3, 3.8, 3.9. So we're generally seeing a little bit of an increase in the nitrogen tissue from, from tall fescue. We're also going to see an increase from the other ones where we start at 4.1 in May, goes up to 4.5 in July, 4.9% in August, 4.5 in September, and it stays in the mid to high fours the remainder of the time. And the same thing holds true for perennial ryegrass, 3.8 in May, 3.5 in June, then it goes up into the fours and almost at 5% by August. Okay. So as the growth rate tends to slow down, we're seeing a relationship between that occurring and the concentration of nitrogen increasing in the turf tissue. Okay. We've talked about that a little bit in the past where oftentimes there's a misconception in at, um, at the end user or the, the, you know, the stakeholders end where there's a misconception that the nitrogen, we just applied nitrogen and uh, it's the summertime and you're going to see nitrogen go up in the, in the leaf tissue. Um, but in cases where the growth rate is slowed in June, July, and August, as opposed to rapid, rapid growth, in cases where it's slowed, sometimes you'll see the, the concentration go up. Okay. So that, that occasionally will happen, and at least it's, it's happening here with cool season grasses. Strangely enough, you'll see the opposite sometimes in warm season grasses, where, where the grass, when it's really growing, growing, growing fast in June, July, and August, you'll, see, you'll also see the, the concentration go down sometimes in those tissues because of, of, of the diluting factor. So I'm gonna, this, the whole point of me going over this is there's a secondary point, but it's to show the growth rate changes as the months change. Uh, and so the, what, was, what was occurring in May is only occurring at a, at a fraction of the, the same magnitude in fall. So we, we cut it off in October. We cut it off after October. We don't see November and December growth rate. I can, I would, I can only speculate what would happen, but I imagine it wouldn't go up. You're going to start ending up with freezing temperatures in November and December, which is maybe why they stopped it in October. Maybe the grass wasn't growing at all and they just didn't have any yield. I don't know. But September and October, there's still some growth rate. And that's, I guess that's why I want to talk about it, is that you're still having some growth in September and October. And I wish they would have shown November and December, but they, they didn't. And like I said, maybe they just didn't have any growth. But there's really not a lot of point in applying nitrogen when the growth, there's no point really in applying nitrogen when the grass isn't growing. If there's, if there's zero chance of the turf grass being able to take up some of that nitrogen, i.e. when the soil is frozen or the turf grass is completely dormant, then applying nitrogen that time, whether it's slow or soluble, makes little, little sense. Okay. And here's some evidence to show the turf grass is slowing down as we, as we move into the fall months. And I, and like I said, I, I would speculate that November and December would be almost zero here. And we have, like I mentioned at the beginning, a YouTuber 
on cool season grasses saying you should be applying you know slow release nitrogen in november and so forth and it's like what the grass is probably isn't even growing then why, why would you be doing that you know there's there's not a lot of support for that recommendation let's go to the daily clipping growth by by uh growth rate so the, the yield within each species so now we're looking at all the cultivars so now you can see the cultivars maybe you're familiar with some of these cultivars obviously kentucky 31 rebel 2 is probably quite familiar with some of the some of falcons probably a familiar name to many many of you if you've used these the uh, kentucky bluegrasses i mean you know i'm not a kentucky bluegrass person even though i'm in kentucky i don't i don't deal with a lot of kentucky bluegrasses but you can see sort of where you're at if you have any of these cultivars or you're familiar with them and it's the same exact table it's just broken out by cultivar may june july august september and october and growth rates and you'll see that the growth rate is very different based upon the cultivar so within a species kentucky bluegrass can range from 3.2 grams per meter square per day down to less than two so basically two so you can have two-thirds of the growth rate that you would expect from kentucky blue just if you have Blacksburg Kentucky Blue relative to Ken Blue Kentucky Blue. So the cultivar makes a huge difference in terms of how much you're gonna, you can expect it to grow. Same thing with perennial ryegrass. You see a reduction of, you know, again, two-thirds uh, of the growth rate. And then in, in tall fescue, you're going to see 3.2 grams per meter square per day, basically the same as Kentucky Bluegrass. You're going to see tall fescues have a very similar. It goes from 3.2 to 1.9, okay? So within a cult of, or within a species, we can't just always say, well, you have Kentucky bluegrass, so this is what you should be doing, and this is what you should expect with, with dry clipping yield, all right? What I really want to talk about is the next table, I believe, <clears throat> which is the nitrogen concentration within species, so the cultivars within species. The range for the Kentucky bluegrass on average ranged from 4.5 to 4.2, and there was a difference between these, these two um, high and low values. There was no difference in the perennial ryegrasses, even though it ranged from 4.4 .4 to 4.1. And then the tall fescues ranged from 3.9 to 3.3 on average through the whole study. And you can see, just like the, uh, the species table, that the, the concentration of nitrogen changes with each month. And the same thing holds true for warm season grasses. And I probably should get off my, off my uh, lazy, <laughs> lazy side and publish these papers because I have some uh, data that, that we collected in Fort Lauderdale that shows the change in nutrient concentrations of leaf tissue um, from, I believe it was Bahia, Bermuda, and St. Augustine grass over many months. And it changes with, for the month. It changes for the species. And so the reason I want to bring this up is because some people hopefully not too much in the lawn care community i don't know but a lot of people in golf are um have been indoctrinated to start to believe and to use leaf tissue analysis as a means to manage their nitrogen applications and so the what this will show if you're using kentucky bluegrass perennial ryegrass and tall fescue is that okay you go out and you take a tissue sample and or, or, or a salesman comes and takes a tissue sample and they're going to base this base their fertility program and they're going to give you a spreadsheet of everything you should be applying based upon that tissue sample well when was it taken oh uh we took it in we took the cool season grass tissue in may okay so you took it in may so let's start with kentucky bluegrass let's just start over here kentucky bluegrass uh what was the nitrogen in the tissue oh it was uh, 4.3 okay 4.3 well if you have bristol it should be 4.5. If you have parade, the average is 4.2. So if you took it and you were you were using parade Kentucky bluegrass and the nitrogen content was 4.3, they're going to spit out a recommendation to apply nitrogen when in fact that particular cultivar is totally normal. The nitrogen concentration in the, t the leaf tissue was completely normal for that particular grass. And if you did it in May, it was 4.1 or whatever. Okay, so... <clears throat> Versus they say, okay, well, we have data on, they don't, but let's say they do have data on uh, Bristol, Kentucky bluegrass. Okay, they, we'd have data on that. Okay, uh, what was the nitrogen concentration? Well, the nitrogen concentration was uh, 4.5. Okay, great, it was 4.5. When was it taken? <clears throat> it was taken in 
in June. Okay, so we took it in June in 4.5. Well, the, the normal would be, or the average of what we're seeing is 3.8, and you're at 4.5. Well, yeah, but the, if it's in September, it's 4.7, and the average is 4.5. You know, So in other words, <clears throat> they might convince you that <clears throat> because it's 4.5, it's not high enough. Meanwhile, in June, it was more than high enough. So when it comes to clipping concentrations, there is variation within months or across months within species. You know, we don't have near enough confidence in clipping concentrations to come anywhere near providing a recommendation to apply a nutrient based on that. But yet, I don't know how many hundreds of superintendents I, I've seen use clipping concentrations or clipping nutrient content as a means to either apply or not apply a nutrient. Okay. And this is nitrogen. This is the most well-studied nutrient in leaf tissue. They're doing, it, they're doing it for phosphorus and iron and manganese and all these other things. And what I'm saying is when someone presents that to you, knowing this table now, knowing these data exist, you should have at least minimal, I am hoping at least minimally, there should be some skepticism on your part because you got to know what cultivar was it? When was it taken? Right. And I can tell you right now with a great deal of confidence, <laughs> they don't have cultivar level data sufficient to even come close to having any confidence in providing a recommendation. There is no such thing. OK, it just doesn't exist. Even these data, which it would, oh, you're looking at them right here, even these data, I would be, you know, skeptical as to whether or not I would even use these data to determine whether or not I should apply nitrogen. I mean, this was done on two years. Well, maybe it's changed. Maybe the maybe the conditions are changed for the next year, for year year. Maybe the maybe the you know correlation between what's in the tissue and turf quality has changed and it's different. I, I'm just saying that I don't have hardly any confidence in using a tissue analysis to apply or not apply a nutrient under normal conditions based upon whether or not it should result in an you know, anticipated outcome in terms of quality. Now, I do have some confidence whenever we're um, checking off boxes as to what potentially could be causing issues for certain things like diseases on, in certain locations. Um, there, there, are, there is some evidence to support some of that usage in, in turf grass nutrient analysis and tissue. There is something there. Um, there are occasions where I might, you know, explore that a little bit, but I would be basing that entirely upon the published results in, in scientific journals, not from someone that walked in my door trying to sell me something. Okay. That's critical to understand. I have no idea where they're getting their ranges from. There's a book on my bookshelf right back here that has turf grass nutrient ranges. I don't know how many they have in here. Let's see if I can even find it. Yeah, right here. Right here. This book right here is called the Plant Analysis Handbook 3. Okay. In this book, there's 44 turf grasses in the back, I think it is. I haven't looked at this book in ages. Yeah, there's all sorts of turf grasses. Okay. So in this book, you'll see, you'll see, uh, tables like this and in there you'll see nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and so forth okay and you'll go well hey well this this book has some data in it this why can't we just use this it has uh it has let's see creeping bent grass it has from field test plots, it has creeping bent grass from golf course greens. It has pen cross creeping bent cross from field. It has all, you know, this seems pretty specific enough, right? But at the beginning of this book, the most important, the most important line in this entire book is at the front of the book. And I'll have to read it to you if I can find it. It might take me a minute. It's important. Let me see if I can find it here. I haven't, like I said, I haven't opened this book up in probably four or five years. Let me see if I can find this thing here. Oh, here we go. Um, 
Okay, here, yeah, so here it is. So there's two different types, in this book, there's two different types of values presented and noted for each nutrient entry. One is the sufficiency value. So in this book, the, each, each entry will have like whether, whether or not it was a survey range or a sufficiency value. Nutrient element concentrations for survey su sufficiency values or nutrient element concentrations for plants where deficiencies, sufficiencies, and toxicity levels have been established over a broad range of growing conditions. Perfect. Sounds good. Survey values. Nutrient element concentrations that have not been clearly identified as being either at deficient or toxic levels covering a broad range of growing conditions. However, in the author's opinion, survey values approximate critical values. And, so basically what it's in, and in here, the, of the 44 turf grasses, I think 40 have survey ranges. And what it's basically saying is 40 of those turf grasses, we don't have sufficiency ranges. It's just sort of a general survey of what it probably is. So even in this book, if that's something they're using as a means to interpret uh, tissue uh, nutrient uh, concentrations, the book itself says it's just a survey value. We don't really know. It wasn't, con it wasn't actually a sufficiency range that, we, that they did because it doesn't exist or whatever the case might be. So I'm saying all that to say this is that if it's published in the literature and you have very similar conditions, then I would have a little bit of confidence in that. But I don't, I know of exactly zero salesmen that walk in with published literature and say, your tish, turf grass tissue in this month on this cultivar should be this, and you're much lower than this. Therefore you should consider applying it. That, that actually might be good evidence if they walked in and did that, but they don't. Okay. So when they don't, that's what you should be thinking. Is there published evidence to support this on my specific turf grass um, during this particular time of year because the concentration could be completely normal and their tissue analysis says it's low well you know that that's uh <laughs> that's what's referred to probably as a charlatan you know they don't they don't care if the turf grass is actually low and they want to sell you something so and it's what I want to do is, is in, in hopefully in, implant something into your, into your consciousness that, you know, is a, a level of skepticism about this stuff. Well, how do I, how would I even go find this out? I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, Dr. Shaggs. I mean, maybe I should be skeptical of some, this is how you go find it out. This is what we're showing. There's this, these data exist. Okay. In some, in some cases they exist. Um, uh, again, it would have to be more specific to your location to use this table for every, everything in here. But if you're in that general area of the United States, these, these would, what I would, I would re rely upon these data far more than what I would rely on someone walking in the door and handing me a pamphlet. So Gray Fox has, would the same be true in ag? And, and at, well, and when, the difference between the, uh, recommendations from someone walking in your door and the recommendations or the results in a published literature is the same. I wouldn't have hardly any confidence on someone walking in my door, trying to sell me something saying that my nutrient levels are low in my tissue. I would have basically zero confidence in that. But in ag, they have a lot more data and results in the, in the published literature than we do. For example, they'll have corn leaf concentrations of, you know, you know, manganese at like silk stage and harvest stage. And, and all, they have all the different stages of corn growth. And they've gone out and they've done that work where so they know, give or take, that the leaf tissue analysis should be around this to maximize your yield at this stage in growth, right? Well, we don't have stages in growth in turf grass in the same fashion as they do in corn, right? So, but in, in ag, I would have far more confidence that the published literature is more useful for them than for us, just because they have more of it and they've gone out and they've done that work more, pro more frequently than we have, okay? Let me continue. Like I said, I probably should have included this paper as a paper in the clipping topic. Let's get into the discussion, I suppose. Results show in recovered in clippings was not only derived from current fertilizer applications, which is which, not, which was not only derived from current fertilizer application, which is not unusual. In other words, they applied nitrogen and they, and they measured it in clippings, but they ended up pulling out more nitrogen than they applied. Okay, these studies, uh, they have a variety of studies. These studies noted current season nitrogen applications contribute only 34 to 47% of total in recovered in clippings, okay? Clipping nitrogen is derived from thatch clippings from previous years and mineralized soil organic nitrogen. 
clippings retained on turf contributed 30% to 50% to current seasonal nitrogen recovery in clippings from these two studies. These authors suggest that fertilizer nitrogen can be reduced by 30 to 50% with no loss of turf quality when clippings are returned. Okay, now what I'm saying is that that is true, but we want to be mindful that if the calibration was conducted on soils that are releasing all that nitrogen, then the rate would have already the recommended rate would have already been lowered because you, there was adding in nitrogen to the study while the study was going on from the from the mineralizing organic matter. So you have to see where the study was conducted in terms of what soils and conditions to see if there was any nitrogen being released or talk to the professor that did it. If you, the nitrogen, we did an end rate study in South Florida where we removed all the organic matter from the top soil. And I need to publish this. And we have basically a new sterile soil, not sterile, but new virgin soil. And we have an established existing soil with deep organic matter. And the nitrogen rates, we did nitrogen rate studies on those two conditions. And the nitrogen rate differences were tremendous between these two soils. The soil with organic matter mineralizing required almost no nitrogen for the full two year study to maintain acceptable turf. And the, the, the soil, the turf grass growing on the soil with no organic matter or less than, it was, I think it was less than 0.5% required substantially more nitrogen. I don't know, I can't remember the rate. I want to say it was like five pounds of nitrogen per year to keep it established, to, to keep it acceptable. Okay. And I, I need to get that thing published. I feel bad I haven't done that yet, but um, but that's what I'm talking about. Yes, you can reduce it, but you can't reduce it if the calibration study was conducted on a similar soil because that included it to begin with. Okay, so be mindful of that. Plots used in this study were seeded on land that had been had been as managed as had been managed as turf for at least 20 years in a grass legume forage stand and for for the previous 20 to 25 years. In other words, it was a well established soil. Uh, plenty of organic material. Analysis of total soil organic nitrogen had indicated levels of about 2,300 kilograms per hectare. So I have to do the math on that. I don't know, 2,300. Yeah, good grief. So that's 50, 46 pounds per thousand per feet of night. Is that right? So, or of organic in. Okay, yeah. So it's a lot of nitrogen in the organic form in that soil. If only 4% of that soil organic nitrogen is mineralized each year, about 100 kilograms, so 2 pounds of nitrogen will be rendered available to the turf grass roots. So this soil was very fertile. It had a very good ability, high ability to mineralize nitrogen. 2 pounds a year per 1,000 square feet was the potential if only 4% mineralized. Adding this to the 200 to the 4 pounds of nitrogen provided by the clippings returned to turf, a significant quantity of nitrogen is present and cycled through turf soil systems. And they quote Kale here on his paper. Based on this analysis, there appears to be ample opportunity to increase in use efficiency in turf grass management. Retaining clippings and accounting for the mineralized soil organic nitrogen should permit reductions in infertilization of about 50 to 75 percent. Achieving these economic would achieving these economic and environmental advantages has promising implications for future research in turf and nitrogen management. That yeah, again, that's true as long as your site does not have the nitrogen. I mean, I'm sorry, as long as your site does have the organic material being mineralized, if your site does not have the organic matter being mineralized, then you can't just go on off and reduce it. Right. What this is saying is if your soils contain this much organic material and it's mineralizing at this rate, you probably don't need to apply much nitrogen. That's exactly what I found in Fort Lauderdale. Probably don't need to apply hardly any. Okay. Because you have, so you have to take, take a look at you know, in this case, a soil test would be beneficial to see what sort of organic ma uh, matter percentages you're dealing with. And then you can estimate the, the mineralization rate of, from that uh, existing organic matter percentage. So if you're at 0.1% organic matter versus 5% organic matter or whatever the case is, you can see that very quickly the potential reduction in nitrogen applications you might have to make on that high organic matter soil. Okay. Conclusions. In conclusion, results from this study indicate genetic variation exists in nitrogen recovery and clippings among three cool season turf grasses at both species and cultivar level. So all, this whole idea of, like I said, I, I just, I'll say this and then I'll try to try to change, but this whole idea of taking a sample from your Tiff Eagle putting green and saying your, your Tiff Eagle should, you know, it's at, you know, 2% nitrogen 
and 1.5% potassium and you need to add more potassium or whatever is hogwash guys. I mean, it just, there's not, you, you need to know specifically on that, that cultivar of Bermuda grass, what is normal. As far as I know, there might be a, there might be some published, well, with Tith Eagle, there is, there's some published information of what sort of normal ranges are, right? Well, let's see what this book says. I saw Tiff Eagle in here. So Tiff Eagle, yeah, here it is, Tiff Eagle. And again, it says survey range, right? So they don't actually have the critical range. It says the nitrogen should be from 2.0 to 3.3%. So if, so if you're a salesman selling nitrogen, selling fertilizer, and you take a tissue sample, Corey, you're going to take 100 tissue samples, 50, whatever. There's going to be some percentage of that that's going to be less than two, but yet be completely acceptable. That's what they're looking for. They're looking for a reason to convince you. Some, what, what will convince that person to buy from me? And if it's less than two, well, this book says it should be two or greater. So that must be a good reason to convince you you need to apply some more nitrogen. Or phosphorus. It says phosphorus is 0.25 to 0.4 for Tiff Eagle. Well, what if phosphorus is 0.15 or 0.18? And my Tiff Eagle looks perfectly fine. Well, no, it's too low. Phosphorus in this book says it should be 0.25 or greater. Okay, so don't have, um, don't don't be easily convinced when someone uses t uh, leaf clippings. I've said all that. Now I'm going to backpedal a little, little bit. There there is value in clipping nutrients, measuring the clipping the nutrients in clippings. There is value to that. Um, but it's really more from a scientific perspective. And there's a, like I said, there's occasionally a case where conf, you can confirm um, certain uh, risks that have already sort of been diagnosed. You can confirm that and have more confidence in that potential risk with a tissue test. You can do that, particularly when it comes to certain diseases. You can say, well, this is likely to occur. It looks like there may be something going on here. We know that this disease is associated with a low nutrient level, let's say manganese or something. And you can take that tissue test and say, well, we are actually are low in manganese here. There actually is an increased risk, risk or, or that we have a high manganese and there's, there's a reduced risk or whatever. So you can use it in some instances, but just to blindly use tissue, uh, clipping analysis and to, to apply fertilizer, we're not there yet with our uh, level of knowledge in turf science. Nitrogen recovery and clippings differed among turf grass species of cult of Kentucky bluegrass and tall fescue more than perennial ryegrass. Nitrogen recovery and clippings fluctuated seasonally. So every you know, if they they have one number on let's use fescue, they they have one number. Your, your nitrogen should be four point one, and well, it depends on what month it was taken, right? If it was June or if it was September, because the normal or the adequate amount of nitrogen in those leaf, that leaf tissue is different at those months. Well, they don't have diff the, the, the people coming in with these, these cell sheets, they don't have detailed changes over months. Okay. I, I did that for, for how long I do that? Six years. I was in sales. Believe me, it doesn't exist. Okay. They have some set value and they have it in an Excel sheet and they just have one value for one species. Occasionally you might have one cultivar or two cultivars. Okay. But what I'm saying is I don't have confidence in those values because of stuff like this, where we see clearly in this table right here, differences exist among cultivars and over time. Okay. You can easily be fooled by someone. Oh, well, hey, you're right. Yeah, it should be, it should be 4.1. It's only 3.8. Well, well, what if you're in June and you have Kentucky bluegrass, Bristol was well, 3.8 is normal. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, last sentence. Most grasses recovered more nitrogen in their clippings than was applied each year as a fertilizer, as fertilizer, indicating substantial contributions from soil organic nitrogen in this long established turf plot area. Clipping nitrogen makes a significant contribution to nitrogen budget and turf. Da, 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 da. So basically what that's saying is, is that nitrogen being mineralized uh, was taken up and it was measured in the leaf's and it was greater than the actual nitrogen that they actually applied, what was taken up in the leaf. So this is unfortunately a challenge that exists with lawn care applicators where you may be going from a new community and then, you know, two minutes later, you have an applicator going to a 30 year old uh, neighborhood that has well-established turf grasses. And you can, you know, it's very difficult to change your programs from one community to the next. One community might look great and that might be the older community and the other community is struggling. Well, 
the difference between those two communities may be the amount of organic matter and the nitrogen being mineralized from those orga- that organic matter that in the older community is actually helping you out. In the newer community that doesn't have that, you probably need to bump it up a little bit. It's not that you can't make it look fine. It's just that the nitrogen being applied might not be sufficient. Now, how logistically how you go about changing all that in your program is <laughs> somebody brighter than me will need to figure that out. But um, but those older communities might do do fine with less nitrogen in the younger communities. You might have to tweak it up just a little bit. Okay. That's sort of the nuts and bolts of this. And the cultivars differ. Nitrogen concentrations and growth rate changes over time. It tends to slow down. It tends to be greatest in the spring for these cool season grasses. And it tends to slow down in the summertime. So these September applications of soluble in are, are justified because we still have some growth rate going on in September, but it's slowing down. And we can imagine November and December, it would slow down even further. So these November and December applications that we've been talking about avoiding or bare minimum greatly reducing is again further justified by the growth rate changes over time over months in this paper okay that's all i got guys um next week i have another author coming on next week so look forward to that this week i didn't have and i don't think i had any authors on this week next week i have another author coming on and uh he's fantastic far, far brighter than I am. <laughs> Whenever I, I, I quickly reach the limits of my knowledge when I'm reading through these things and I'm like, yeah, let me call somebody, see if I can get them on here. Cause I don't understand this. So he's coming on next week. Uh, next week should be very normal. It's a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, 10 AM, um, time, but Wednesday will be at that 9 PM. I think I'm going to start sticking to that 9 PM time frame. We seem to have quite a few viewers at that time. So um, look forward uh, to that next week. If there's nothing else um, in the chat, oh, lush, I love the deep dive, sir. You, you're a long geek stream. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm a long geek stream. All right. Um, I, pre- I appreciate all the kind words. You guys are so kind to me. I don't. I, I wish I knew what I did maybe you know, to, to, to deserve all this. But uh, anyway, I hope you found it useful. Have a great weekend. I'll be back on Monday at 10 a.m., if you, uh, if you need to get a hold of me or you want consulting services, you can always go to calendly.com slash Travis Shaddix and set something up with me on my calendar. You can see all my calendar when it's available if you would look for, if you want to do that. Otherwise, uh, I'll talk to you guys next Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern time. Have a great weekend. Thanks so much for coming by. See you. Bye.